As Arkansas's population grows, so do our energy demands. But with the right mix of resources, reliable, affordable power will always be a reality. These resources are all around us in our rivers, blowing through our trees, even right below our feet. The answer isn't focusing on one resource, it's embracing them all. The electric cooperatives of Arkansas know that a balanced approach to power builds our communities and powers our dreams. Visit themixmatters.com and see why there's power in knowledge. All right, Governor, first of all, thank you so much for sitting down with us. We appreciate your time. Public My pleasure. Public Employee Insurance Special Session uh, on the uh, soon to be called, I think. Where do we stand on this? Well, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, I anecdotally got some information yesterday they were changing the bill again. I don't know if that's true because we haven't seen anything specific, nor have we heard directly from the sponsors, but we've got some background information that we're changing it again. So if that's true, then it's all back to square one because we have to see the bill. Uh, if the bill that we've already seen and that theoretically is being circulated among the members of the General Assembly is the bill, then I uh, will support that bill and will call a session if I get a roll call from each house that uh, suggests that there's uh, significantly over the majority needed to be able to pass it. The reason I say that is you don't call special, I don't call special sessions unless uh, we can get it done in three days, which is the constitutional minimum. Uh, for how long it takes to pass bills through both houses. And I've lived through governors calling special sessions that lasted a month, and I don't do that. If it's not, uh, a special session needs to be restricted to something that's an emergency that needs to be done, that there's such a consensus on that we can get in and out in three days and not waste taxpayer money. So that's what the hang-up is right now. Uh, which bill is it? Is it the bill that we've seen and approved and being circulated? If it is, uh, is there uh, a sufficient majority uh, so that you could even uh, maybe lose a few votes if people wavered at the last minute and still be assured that you're going to get in and out and accomplish your purpose in uh, three days. you feel confident, though, that you guys will get there on this particular issue, this teacher insurance fund? No, I don't, not at all. I mean, I, I think... Uh, I think the feedback that I've gotten is that there, there's some uh, disagreement among members of the General Assembly. Now, I know that the, the people that have worked very hard, Senator Hendren and Representative Copenhaver, have both indicated confidence, and, uh, and certainly they're close to it. So uh, I, I'm, to some extent, I'm going to defer uh, to that information that they think we're going to get there. Uh, but I temper that with, I've gotten feedback from other members, particularly the Senate, that say they're having a difficult time reaching that consensus. So uh, I don't know that you can say as we speak here today that it's a done deal. Uh, I, I think uh, in the next few days we'll know for sure. What's your sense from talking to those House and Senate leaders of what the potential hang-up is? Is it the dollar figure amount or is it the way that the oh, I think it's two potential things. solutions been structured? I, I think it's the, the solutions. Uh, I think there's some opposition uh, to taking part-timers off, mm -hmm. and I think there's some opposition to uh, redirecting some of that uh, FICA saving money uh, that uh, theoretically is going to be generated to go away from the public schools generally and into insurance payments. Uh, so those are the two areas that I've gotten feedback on. Uh, and I think it's even been reported. Uh, sure. and, and I think some of the constituencies like uh, the school administrators uh, and, uh, and some of the superintendents, uh, the administrators association and some individual superintendents have expressed some opposition to those aspects. To the extent that they're influencing any of those members of the General Assembly, that could be what we're seeing right now. There is a possibility of other items being put on a call for a special session. I've heard everything from prison reform to lotteries to potentially broadband, open government records. What in your estimation, because you get to make the decision on that, what do you see as a realistic possibility of well, something else that may be added? Well, if we're going to have a session, I think we need to address the problems our counties are having in the county jails and our, in our prison backup if we've got a solution to it. And we do. Uh, it's a little complex. I don't know how much you want to get into it, but uh, I've been able to identify $6.3 million in ongoing revenue that could be available, not just for the immediate fix, but long term. Mm -hmm. uh, and Where does that $6.3 million come from? A number of years ago, we had some agencies coming out of the State Central Services Fund that were overspending, or at least expanding, and the State Central Services Constitutional Officers Fund uh, was, was running... Uh, not necessarily a deficit, but it was getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's funded with 3% off the top. We increased that percentage to 3.3% to cover that problem. 
Now we've built those balances back up to the point and, and that spending has leveled off vis-a-vis -vis the growth in, in revenue to the point that we can legitimately afford to go from 3.3 down to 3.2 uh, off the top for constitutional and fiscal agencies. We're still building slowly that balance mm -hmm. up to, to uh, the balance you want to have to be fiscally responsible. That frees up $6.3 million that's ongoing money and $6.3 million will get you 600 actual new beds uh, in a combination of areas that already exist without building anything new, but just staffing it so that we could uh, reduce that backlog by 600. What about any of the other uh, possibilities that I threw out there? Lottery restriction, broadband, uh, the, open government if records? The, if the legislature wants to hold off on that lottery restriction and, and take it up uh, in the regular session by putting a moratorium on it through a special session, and if they have that same kind of consensus, then I'll include that. If not, I won't. Anything else? And that's all I know of right now. That's, a, that's all you're pondering right now? Precisely. Could be more, though. You're uh, leaving the door in, open. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, broadband needs to be addressed, uh, and uh, the law needs to be changed in that regard. Uh, the task force uh, said it needed to happen. I've come out for it. DIS understands it has to happen. Uh, there's a lot of opposition from uh, the, the telecoms, as sure. you might imagine. Uh, but that's, the, uh, that's not ripe. Uh, the legislature's not ready to address that. There hadn't been enough discussion about it. There's still, uh, uh, there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be fleshed out, but uh, they'll probably have to deal with that later. Let's shift to a trade mission you have coming up. You're going to Europe for the second time in your administration. Uh, over the last, I think 2009 was the last time you were there. Air show in London, you're going to Paris, and you're going to Czechoslovakia. Tell me what's going to go on on this trip. Who are you meeting with? And, I mean, without hopefully, betraying any confidence. Hopefully it'll be, uh, they won't kill me like they did on the China trip uh, a couple of years <laughs> ago. And we were just talking earlier. I think it was, uh, we were 11 days in country. I think it was 13 days counting the travel time. And uh, I think we in, were in eight different hotels and eight different cities and provinces and, and all that stuff. Uh, it, it was, uh, I was ready for... Uh, and you love to travel so much, oh, too, yeah, so that just made yeah. it so I'm much just, more enjoyable. I'm just really a big traveler. That's why I don't go much. No, this is, uh, the air show is uh, specifically designed to address our current uh, aviation industry uh, uh, presence in Arkansas from Europe, as well as uh, potentially to get some more mm -hmm. or some expansion. Uh, everybody knows about Dassault, but you know, uh, our number one manufacturing export in Arkansas is aerospace. And uh, this is a big deal. They have this show in London one year, Paris the next year. They alternate between the two. And it's a trade show and an economic development. Uh, I've never been. Uh, they've tried to get me to go before, uh, but uh, so I'm going. Uh, and then Paris is, uh, as you might imagine, part of uh, those companies that we already have uh, uh, cultivated a great relationship with, and we continue to cultivate that relationship. You know, we just expanded Dassault. Uh, we've courted Dassault. And, that was uh, one of the fruits of the labor right, of 2009. Right, exactly. And now we've expanded that, and with the potential for even further expansion, and maybe even a supplier or two there. Czechoslovakia is totally different. Actually, it's the Czech Republic now because they've, they've uh, split Czechoslovakia into the Czech Republic and uh, Slovakia. Uh, they've had very little, if any, state gubernatorial contact uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and there are a number of businesses in the Czech Republic that are looking at North American presence. And uh, it's fertile field because, you know, now everybody's going to China and everybody's going to Taiwan. and and Paris and London and all those other things. Uh, we'd like to get in on the ground floor of, uh, of what uh, the Czech Republic companies might be interested what kind in. kind of companies exist in the Czech Republic? Not something that every man in Arkansas would know well, off the top uh, of their head. The, the kinds of things that uh, you would expect. They've got significant arms manufacturing and uh, they've got uh, parts manufacturing, uh, automobile parts manufacturing. Uh, they've got uh, uh, a pretty broad array of manufacturing uh, opportunities. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, I've been asking a number of legislators about what they see happening in terms of workforce development. Yeah. Um, obviously a big push from the last regular uh, fiscal session right. uh, to make some changes. Give me an update of where workforce education and that whole overhaul exists at this point in time. Are you satisfied with the progress that's being made? Oh, I'm satisfied with the fact that everybody's got it on the front burner. Uh, and that everybody uh, recognizes that some coordination of effort could improve everything. Uh, 
uh, we've got a lot of success stories, and there have been a lot of good things that have happened. Now, you know, I, I continually point out to what happened in South Arkansas Community College and how they've worked with businesses down there uh, to create these process uh, managers and, and uh, all the folks in the industry are in and around South Arkansas uh, that need specialized uh, training and how that community college has responded with the appropriate curricula to, to make that done. Great success story. Same thing in West Memphis. Great success story with what uh, Glenn Fenner's done over there to, to make curriculum and course offerings responsive to the needs of business and industry. Pulaski Tech has done a good job. Even some of our four-year schools, you know, Molex had trouble with engineers, with the kind of engineers that they specifically needed, and only uh, Purdue and, uh, and uh, Texas a and M were turning out those kind of engineers. Uh, ULR changed some of their engineering curriculum to meet those needs. So we've got pockets of success stories. Uh, Fort Smith has done some good stuff. What we don't have is the kind of coordinated across the board, everywhere success stories that you'd like to have. And workforce development may be the number one key to economic recruitment, retention, expansion. Uh, we hear stories that, uh, you know, you got a lot of people unemployed, but then they've got a lot of jobs open and waiting right. uh, because the skill levels of the people unemployed don't match uh, the needs of business and industry. So it's part of the state's responsibility. We did this with Hino when we totally changed that whole situation and turned something that was pretty bad into something that was pretty good. Uh, so the state has a responsibility to try to be responsive to the needs of business and industry, primarily through its technical institutes and its two-year colleges, but uh, not necessarily limited to that. There are cases where our four-year schools and our four-year degrees need to be uh, doing some of the th same thing. What's going on now, and, and Senator English deserves a lot of credit, but so does his workforce uh, cabinet. Uh, pooling the resources from all those different efforts that currently exist and try to do it in a comprehensive and cohesive way that gets the best bang for the taxpayer's buck. You mentioned earlier, I mean, business leaders tell me, they tell you, we've got these job openings, mm -hmm. we can't get enough uh, of these types of, right. uh, you know, manufacturing line right. type uh, employees or whatever the, the business may be. Does it require something to to move things faster? Like uh, I have suggested that maybe we look at a workforce czar in the state of Arkansas, somebody that can cut through some of the bureaucracy, not have to worry about the political dynamics, which are too extensive to go into at this point in time, as you well know. Uh, I mean, does it need somebody that almost can be a benevolent dictator and make this stuff happen? Uh, you, you, that's certainly one approach. Uh, I'm pretty much a benevolent dictator to let them know that we expect results and we expect them to work together. But there's a good point to be made that the governor's usually got so many plates that he has to balance from education uh, to uh, prisons to uh, health care to all sorts of things that uh, sometimes it's hard to devote as much time to that one topic. Sure. Uh, so uh, if a governor's not going to do it, a czar certainly could, but you could also have uh, uh, an agency that with a cabinet head that uh, you designate as a lead uh, to go get it done. Right now, the legislature is doing a good job of becoming a czar on this mm -hmm. on this uh, expanded uh, and yet collaborative effort. Uh, so I expect you'll see you may end up with a bunch of czars, which may be as problematic as not having <laughs> one at all. Too many uh, cooks in the kitchen yeah. there. Let's shift our gears to talk about health care. We've got a few minutes left here to talk about that. Uh, we have seen obviously a lot of debate and a lot of political potential change for sure. the private option sure. and its potential fate. You have said that you see, uh, you're not ready to write the private options obituary yet. You're oh, no. optimistic about it. Absolutely. I'm what always makes, optimistic. What makes you optimistic about it with what you know in terms of the vote count down in the Senate at this point in time? Well, first of all, uh, you got about 175, 180,000 working, primarily working Arkansans. These aren't folks laying around doing nothing. There are people that work for businesses that don't carry health care coverage and they don't make very much money. Some of them are trying to go to school at the same time that they're working 40 hours a week trying to just put uh, bread on the table. Uh, it'd be very difficult to throw 180,000 people off health care. That's item one. Item two, the actual uh, math for all this is uh, still present. Uh, we're going to be paying for this as our Kansas, whether we take it or not. These other states have figured that out. The Joplin uh, editorial uh, yesterday said, you know, they're closing hospitals or they're laying off folks in Missouri because they wouldn't do what Arkansas did. And uh, it can have a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic effect on hospitals. Here's why. 
part of what they did in Washington, and you don't have to like them or like what they did in Washington or like Obamacare. It, it then becomes, whether you like it or not, if you want to change it, go to Washington. If, as long as it's not changed, what does Arkansas do to take advantage the, what, the best we can for our Kansans and for our businesses and for our hospitals and for our taxpayers? And so uh, the hospitals are helping to pay for this under the federal law with yeah. a reduction in Medicare payments. Sure. If they don't get the Medicaid expansion to offset it, they're really in the hole. It's $28 million so That was a the year. crux of the Supreme Court decision yeah. that, that kind of changed the dynamic yeah. on this. And it's $28 million a year just to uh, uh, UAMS alone. But here's, a, here's a, another reason for my optimism. If you've got 74 percent of the legislature that's for this and 26 percent that's against it, do you think that 74 percent is going to let that 26 get away with that? I mean, I, I expect there will be as much, uh, because it takes a three-fourths vote, I expect there will be as much of that 74 percent as is possible uh, to force somebody's hand. Do you worry about some of the politicians who have boxed themselves so in a corner always, with their always, position on this that always. they cannot change it and survive politically? You always worry about that. Uh, that's why. Uh, that's why you may see some tweaking to the point that it allows some cover for some of those folks that once they look at the whole world and see the whole picture, uh, they back off rhetoric when they were running and didn't know any better and uh, look at the realities and what it'll do. It, there's a $100 million hole in the budget if they do away with it. What are they going to do with that? You're not going to take it away from education. Supreme Court won't let you. Prisons are already in trouble. Where are you going to get the money? Gonna have they to start some of those tax cuts, aren't it, they? they? Precisely. I don't see that happening. Well, if they don't, then they've got a huge hole. And, and you know, that, that's just the reality of governing. Uh, we'll when, grow our way out of it, Governor. Isn't that what they always that's say? What we'll grow always, our way out of it. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm a fiscal conservative. I don't do that stuff. <laughs> we got about a minute left here. Last question for you. Payment reform initiative. This is another health care oh, yeah. uh, issue, separate from the private option. Right. I had Peter Banco on the show last week from St. Vincent's, and he said he is seeing, seeing some really significant savings throughout their health care system. Uh, America has to do this. I think the other 49 states are going to follow Arkansas. I think the federal government's end up going to follow Arkansas. The old fee-for-service model is unsustainable. It's never going to continue to be able to work. This is the way the country has to go, and Arkansas is leading the way.